Hi everybody! Welcome to PBTP, Powered by the Players. Powered by the Players is an actual play podcast featuring mini campaigns and one-shots of all your favorite PBTA games. Each campaign or one-shot will be a different Powered by Apocalypse game with a rotating cast of diverse players. Let's power up! What's up everybody? Kristen here. Before we get to the game, I want to take a moment to tell you about an exciting new tabletop RPG coming to Kickstarter. Jang Shi Blood in the Banquet Hall was created by Banana Chan and Sen Fun Lim. It is an RPG of Chinese immigrants running a family restaurant by day and dealing with the hauntings of Jang Shi by night. I have had the pleasure of playtesting this game multiple times and can tell you it is a game full of family tension, silliness, and heart as well as action and investigation while defeating Jiang Shi, also known as Hopping Vampires. Banana and Sen are both incredibly talented designers with several previous successful projects. You can find Jiang Shi Blood in the Banquet Hall on Kickstarter today. With all that out of the way, let's get to our one-shot horror game of Bluebeard's Bride. y'all welcome to power by the players an actual play podcast for power by apocalypse games um if you don't know me i am morgan your uh groundskeeper for this evening because we are playing bluebeard's bride a feminist horror game by whitney stritz beltran marissa kelly and sarah richardson based off the bluebeard fairy tale it's a feminist horror game based on the aspects of the bride herself going through the mansion of bluebeard and seeing all the horrors that he's done to the bride before I have four, I'm not going to say victims because that seems a little harsh. (laughs) I have four wonderful players joining me for today uh, to play a part of Bluebeards. Why don't y'all go ahead and introduce yourselves for me, please? Uh, Hello, my name is Fiona Howitt. My pronouns are she, her. I am the host and regular GM for What Am I Rolling, a twice monthly RPG one-shot podcast. Um, I've not played bluebeard's bride before i actually funded the kickstarter when it first came out and then recently a friend for my 30th birthday bought me the actual book but it's something i've read through and i'm like oh this is this is gonna be exciting because to sort of answer the next question i love horror i love scaring myself i recently bought a game called moons of madness which is a bit like uh if you've ever played uh, prey on the uh, on the xbox or ps4 it's like a space space version bioshock but with Call of Cthulhu elements. And my God, the first 10 minutes, I scared myself so much and I'm on my own currently. So it's like, but yeah, I love that stuff. I love like Alien, Alien Isolation, all that stuff. I'm here for horror, for sure. Uh, Hi, I am Mariam. I go by they, them pronouns and I am the GM and creator of the Masafers podcast, which is an actual play podcast. And I'm currently now a cast member for... Uh, Soul Story Season 2, which is coming up pretty soon. And uh, I this is my second time playing in two weeks. Yay for social distancing! Yeah, I'm excited to play this again because I had so much fun the first time. I'm not really a horror media person. Um, it depends on the horror. I think I go for more like Haunted House sort of a feel, because that's my jam. Literally, I think, Morgan, you've played one of my games. And yeah, that's that's me. Hi, my name is Gemma. Um, I usually go around the interwebs as Kupo. Um, you can find me on Discord at Kupo9 and on Twitter, uh, re-blo- uh, retweeting stuff, reblogging. Who uses Tumblr anymore? My pronouns are they, them. Uh, things I'm working on, um, I kind of just flit about. So um, I'm usually on the Welcome to the Party uh, streaming channel. So uh, currently at Welcome to the Party season, I am playing a Star Wars live stream um, using um, Hyperdrive from the system uh, Airlock. And it's been super fun. Um, that's on Thursday evenings. Other than that, I am usually retweeting stuff and cheerleading um, Welcome to the Party's uh, one-shot um, BIMPOC channel, um, Vibrant Visible Victorious. And you can find more information about that on vibrantvisiblevictorious.com. In terms of horror, I run the opposite direction. I don't like it. Thrill rides? Nope. But 
psychological stuff that deals with the mind and makes me think that's what attracts me, I think. And that's why I feel like games such as Bluebeards or or any other like role playing games I get attracted to. Like I just played Ten Candles a couple of weeks ago and I loved it. Um, there's just something about role playing that type of horror, which is great for me, but yeah, put me in things that pop out scaring me. Like, no, no. So I'm very excited to play this. I've been wanting to play Bluebeards for a very long time. So I'm very happy I was invited to play this. So thank you. Uh, I'm Diana Lorraine. Uh, when I'm not hanging out over here, I am a cast member of the Space Agers, which is a Kids on Bikes, Teens in Space actual play podcast. And then I am also one half of Macintosh and Mod, which is a My Little Pony podcast. And then there's also the Dog House, which is a Riverdale rewatch and review podcast. And then through my uh, movie podcast, I have actually become more of a horror fan. Um, so like actually like watching them and being a little more analytical, I've actually started to enjoy horror where I previously was a little more like, eh, no thanks. And so like, like sitting down to watch like Saw and like analyzing like its value is been like, okay, I want to watch more of these and other horror films and get into it. So I'm, I'm new to horror, but I'm starting to really enjoy it. Hi, I'm Morgan Nuncio. I am your groundskeeper for this game. Uh, my pronouns are both they, them, and she and her uh, interchangeably. Da, ba, ba. Uh, have I played Bluebeards, Bluebeards before? Yes, yes, I have. I played it once and I really enjoyed it. Uh, that's the reason why I wanted to bring it out as well. Another reason is like sometimes you just want to one shot to break up some of these like campaigns that we have and just shake things up a bit. So why not? I like horror movies. I like horror games. Do I like haunted houses? Hell no. Things I'm working on. I'm part of the Red Death on the Roleplay Network. I am on uh, Roleplay Network's, you know, games on occasion. I think right now, if this releases the same time as End of the World, I'm on that. If not, I'm on some other things there too. You can find me. Now you'll get to sit back for a second while I read you the story of Bluebeard. Once upon a time, there lived a lord whose palace was so splendid and so richly furnished that even the sultans could not compare it with it. He had dishes of gold and silver, sofas and chairs upholstered in the finest silk. The walls were adorned with every kind of curious antique. There was, however, something very odd about this lord. The color of his beard was a rich and shocking blue. His countenance was both distinct and unmistakable, and so he was never spoken by his real title, which was so great and noble but instead he was simply referred to as Bluebeard. He was a fearsome man with deep set eyes and he was known for having an e uneven temper. Even so, Bluebeard had been married many times. No one quite knew what had become of each of his wives in turn, as there had never been a funeral at the palace that anyone living could remember. They simply vanished and when time passed, he would marry anew. One day Bluebeard went hunting in the countryside near his estate. With the sun high, he came upon a dilapidated farmstead in which the slate kissed their rest. The farmers were eager to please the powerful lord and sent their lovely young daughter scurrying to serve him tea and bread. Bluebeard was instantly smitten with her beauty. He decided right then and there he would take her as his wife. For a week, he entertained her amongst a cadre of fine lords and ladies. No expense was spared. His wealth was dazzling in a way a cobra dazzles a mouse. After that single hedonistic week, Bluebeard came to call with a marriage proposal. Bluebeard scared the young woman, but she couldn't let her family languish in poverty. And besides, maybe his beard wasn't quite that blue. She accepted his proposal. In short order, they were married at the palace. Such a sight it was. A thousand white lilies decorated the pagoda for the ceremony. Delightful incense burned throughout the night. The young bride awoke the next morning in her bed alone, her marriage yet inconsummated. This caused her some amount of anxiety, yet also some relief. She was escorted by a servant to the dining hall, and there she found Bluebeard breaking his fast. He greeted her cheerily and bade her eat. Bluebeard informed her that he received urgent news and must leave at once on a journey of much importance and would likely be gone for many weeks. To console her, he kissed her affectionately and gave her the keys to every drawer in the house. He bade her to amuse herself in, the, in his absence. 
Here, he said, are the keys to your new home. The smallest key, my dear, is for the closet at the end of the gallery. Open everything, go everywhere, stay this one little room. I forbid you to use that key. The bride promised to faithfully obey his orders. She stood waving to him from the palace gates as a caravan of camels and horses kicked up a trail dust as they departed. No sooner was he gone than she began to wonder what is possibly been hidden in the forbidden door. Did he hide disturbing habits or unseemly desires? Was there some secret treasure known only to those noble blood? Did he hide a mistress? Or was it something too terrible for her innocent mind to guess at? She distracted herself with the idea of exploration of the palace. She inspected the galleries, each more magnificent and splendid than the last. She tried on exotic furs and rubbed herself in priceless oils. She visited the servants in the kitchen, which caused quite a stir, and luxuriated in steamy marble baths. All the while, her curiosity was gnawing at her. Was not the palace now her domain? Did not her husband trust her with his secrets? She idled in the bedchambers, became lethargic and gloomy. The splendor of her surroundings took on a sour bend as she could finally take no pleasure in them. Finally, she could not resist the siren call of the forbidden door no longer. In the pitch of the night, she took a single lamp and descended a black and descended a back staircase to the gallery. Upon reaching the closet door, she paused, remembering her husband's command. She feared what might happen if she disobeyed, but the impulse of her curiosity was too strong to resist. With trembling hands, she fit the small key into the locked door and opened the door. At first, with the weak lamplight, she could not see much. As her eyes adjusted, she realized what was in her room. The floor was covered in congealing blood, and the walls were lined with headless bodies, Bluebeard's previous wives. A great scream tore itself from her throat, and she dropped the key. It was a few moments before she came back to herself. In a day, she grabbed the key from the floor and rushed out of the room. She locked it behind her and returned to her chambers. In the daylight of the final morning, it was all she seemed like a dream, but when she examined the small key, she found the stained blood upon it. She wiped it carefully, but the blood remained. Then she washed it and scoured it with sand, but to no avail. That very evening, Bluebird came back from his jury, saying he had received word on the road and the business has already been settled. His wife tried her hardest to be appear happy at his return, but on the inside she quailed. She waited with dread anticipation for him to ask her upon uh, the return of his keys. He did so upon the next morning. He looked through the keys and saw the little one was stained. How come there's blood upon this key? I do not know, she faltered. But I do. You have done as I have forbidden. Well, now you will go in once again and take your place among the ladies you were so curious to see. The bride threw herself at her husband's feet and begged him to forgive disobedience. But Bluebeard had a heart of plenty stone. Prepare your death, he declared. No, please, give me but a few minutes, she cried, so that I might pray. Bluebeard agreed, and the bride rushed to the top of the nearest tower, hoping against hope that someone, such as her father or mother, may be approaching for her visit, so she could give them a sign to make haste. Penance whipped silently in the sun, but nobody was coming. The bride wept bitterly. Given no choice, the bride descended. He led her towards a tiny, horrible room. Near its entrance, he bared and did kneel on the rough flagstone. She obeyed, weeping, and without ceremony, he chopped off her head and put her body in among the rest of the wives. The end. Now you know the story of Bluebeard. This is a game that we take on a new aspect of Bluebeard's wife. It's not going to follow exactly with the lines of the story itself. You know, fairy tales are fairy tales for a reason. And so this game is about this new bride, isolated in the house, filled with taunting ghosts and creeping horrors. This new bride that we're going to be playing, um, which will be all of y'all playing various aspects, um, young, inexperienced, and haunted by the specter of generational poverty. Um, there's much at stake in her for making this marriage work, and she may decide to go to great lengths to preserve what little she has. Conversely, she may be dead set on resisting temptations such as a beautiful lie, such as a beautiful lie, and so tirelessly have enough evidence to make her a case to local authorities before it's too late. An intelligent lady already knows the, um, how this is going to end for a bride badly. Um, in the end, she she's what you make of her, quite literally. Take risks and push boundaries. What worse could happen? 
So now this is where we pick our sisters. Um, basically, these, the sisters are the aspects of the bride itself. Each player will pick a unique sister to play, but some actions may lead, to, lead the bride to be harmed through physical, mental, and emotional violence called trauma, as y'all can see from the character sheets. And sometimes one sister may receive too much harm, which will she'll shatter, losing that part of herself to madness forever. Each sister may view evidence differently. This allows the bride to be complex, even contradictory feelings about things and people she encounters. So choosing your sister uh, with this, basically that means we'll be choosing either the ones, the, the five aspects that are available are the animus, the fatale, the mother, the virgin, and the witch. All right, the animus, uh, you hold on to righteousness with both hands. Others admire your strength and value your will. Fatale, you drip sensuality from your lips. Others watch your every move and crave for you to take control. The mother, you walk with authority, others ache for your approval and long for you to soothe their wounds. The Virgin, you see beauty where there is none, others seek comfort in your warmth and delight in your obedience. And then last is the Witch, you break magic from shadow and blood, others desire a taste of your sin and pray for your undoing. So those are the five aspects that are in play. So everybody get to your respective play sheets. All right, so which one did we not choose? The Animus, is that right? Uh, yeah, the, the Animus. animus. We didn't watch. Okay, we didn't I'm going to just delete this whole row then. We don't Oop. care about the hands. Bye. We don't Goodbye. care. <laughs> she, she doesn't even have hands. It's just stumps. Oh, no. It's just little stumpy stumps, you know. Just... The horror begins. She how does, she even, how does she, she even use the keys? That's with the thing. her mind. Yes. I was going to say no, with her mouth. Scan. Retinal oh, scans. Okay. Oh, retinal scans. Yeah. I'm just I'm on 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 <laughs> I was gonna say her mouth. Hey, hey two things can be true. <laughs> <laughs> or her it's feet, a retinal or any scan of that. and a Dutch thing with her mouth. Oh, and then and then a foot God. to push the door open. It's fine. All right. Well, now that we chose our sister and got past setting and y'all's <laughs> silliness, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's let's start some wedding preparation. Um, we don't have the animus, so the fatale. Huh? Oh man, why am I first? Because <laughs> you're you, first in <laughs> uh, um, right. What does the bride's mouth look like? How do others keep her quiet? I want to say like deceptively normal. Like it's not luscious, plump. I mean, there is a bit of plumpness, but it's not like over exaggerated. But it's like, but it's more of the expressions that the lips make that she expresses that, uh, that turns heads or makes people think thoughts. Um, the next question is, uh, how do others keep her quiet? I'll just go with the simple answer, her mouth. Do they just like physically close her mouth? Yeah, that's also kind of like, I feel like that would be also her, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> like, it, 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 oh, like, er erogenous? Oh, erogenous. Yeah, like something like that where it's like, if someone just puts a finger to, she's like, ooh. I, I was actually thinking, like, shut up and kiss me sort of a thing. You know, when people make people <laughs> quiet, but I just... Yeah, she doesn't mind that at all. If it's a kiss, if it's a, if it's a hand. Thank you. Um, mother, what is the bride's figure like? I'm gonna go with hourglass. Very Joan Holloway. All right. Next question is, uh, what do others wish was different about it? Because you know everybody has opinions, so... Uh, I'm sh other people would probably say that she needed to be slimmer. All right, Virgin. What do the bride's eyes look like? They are big doe eyes. Uh, I would say a very piercing blue. Okay. So big, innocent doe eyes that are just this bright, piercing blue. I love it. And the next question is, how do others know you want them when, the ga when they gaze into your eyes? when they see a reflection of themselves in my eyes. Okay, uh, next question is for the witch. Hello. What is the bride's hair like? So the bride's hair is very different in, obviously, with fantasy, obviously, most uh, female presenting characters obviously have very long hair, luscious hair. Now, she's going to go proper short, cut short. You could say, like, my hair. If I would just show people on video, it won't make any good for podcasts, but I had it cut recently. <gasps> Heck yeah! Oh, oh, you did have a cut! 
so yeah, like like that. So like sort of like a little bit long in the front, perhaps maybe up to sort of eye level, but then at the back it's sort of shaved towards the skull, like a um, fade. Yeah. All right. What color is her hair? Her hair is it's just going to be mousy blonde. Like, really unassuming, really sort of, no, because obviously there's, again, in fantasy, it's always like, oh, reds and, 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 and blacks and stuff. No, no, mousy blonde. And is it wavy or pretty straight or? Um, I'd say wavy. All right. And your next question is, how do others like you to wear it? They probably prefer it not to be so short. They're like, oh, you know, just grow it out a bit. Just make it longer. Like, they, they probably appreciate it can't be too long or that, like, you know, because it gets a bit irritating, but like, oh, just frame your face. So I think that's what they want to do, just make it grow a little bit. But I think at the first sign of it getting past the cheekbones, like, nope, off it goes. All right. Next question that I have is, what are you leaving behind from your provincial life to become Blue Bridge Bride? And this is this is for everybody now. So oh, like, it's for everyone. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you can you can hold off, Fiona, if you want to wait to hear this. Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah. Okay, I've already so answered. we'll start at the top. Uh, Fatal. I guess security, because... The Fatal, she uses this aspect of herself as a way of protection and maybe as a weapon. And, you know, her town, like, she's already familiar with the ins and outs and the people around them. So she knows how to push buttons and when she, and, like, she already knows how to protect herself there. But here, where she's going, she doesn't know. Um, It's basically unknown, so. The the certainty, maybe, of of her home yeah secure security or control oh yeah i think that's a better wording for it mother same question for the mother it's going to be something like more tangible i'm going to say that she's like giving up like a gourmet kitchen virgin same question i'm gonna say she's leaving her her lover behind a witch Again, probably following what uh, the mother said, something sort of physical. There'll just be her piles of books. Like she really loves reading. She's really into sort of learning and that knowledge. And obviously, with the marriage and stuff and moving out, well, they've got books there. Why would why would she need to bring her own book? And so that's sort of the loss of like well, her not even her possessions, but that sort of her knowledge, her, the, the you know her notebooks, her all this sort of thing. Okay, so a follow-up question is, um, Fatal, starting with you again. Mm-hmm. When you first met, what loving gesture did Bluebeard make that won you over? I think the first night he courted me, or us, instead of, he ended the night with just a very chaste kiss to my hand. And that endeared me to him because usually the first night ends with more than that. Mother, same question. He had my favorite meal prepared. All right. Do you have an idea what the favorite meal is or are you just like, he just... Roasted duck. All right. Um, Virgin, same question. When we first met, I think the loving gesture that Bluebeard made was to look directly into my eyes and for a moment i saw myself reflected in his eyes um which same question i think he would have tried to woo me and then finding out how much i enjoy to read he would have picked out like almost like a reading list of certain uh, written works that i would have enjoyed and at the top would have been a book on poetry uh talking about now i'm not gonna go as far as like he wrote it himself about me but it feels like it was deliberately picked um, to describe me and about uh, a man wooing a, a lady and like, oh, it just, it just so happens just to be perfect. And it really entices me to it. All right. So the next question is, what gifts did you present to Bluebeard before the wedding? Why did you choose this? Um, we'll start at the top again, Patel. I decided on it's going to be like a pendant with a with like uh, just some type of uh, like a gem inside. Maybe, I don't know, maybe like an emerald or something. But it was given as a gift to her. It was one of her first gifts um, from one of her many suitor, suitoresses, suitor thems. And uh, it was basically, it was a token just from that person saying that, oh, 
like this reminds me of you and your beauty this reflects who you are or what they think of her so um she kind of gave that to him as like since that was her first her first token she wanted him to have it as a reflection of herself excellent mother i presented him with a uh, a collection of my best recipes to show him that I'm going to be able to cook for him well. And that's that's why you did it, so you can show him how to cook? Or just tell him that you can cook, not how to cook? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, Virgin. It's a very simple uh, silver and gold intertwined ring that is essentially a chastity ring. It is not just something she had worn. It is something that was given to her by her ex-lover slash best friend. It might have been given to him as a sort of a commitment, but also partly out of spite. All right. Um, which? I will uh, give Bluebird a pressed flower. Um, basically, as I'm very into sort of the books and stuff, but also sort of nature and stuff, I find the beaut- the most beautiful... Um, let's say orchid uh, a nice blue orchid why not, we'll go with a theme and I get it pressed and I might spend a couple of days trying to sort of make sure it's completely flattened and stuff and then when I when it comes out it isn't just a beautiful sort of like open present- presentation and I sort of cu- uh, have it sort of in beautiful paper and it's just a simple frame, maybe like a uh, just uh, something very simple, but to show sort of the beauty I found in his his words and his um, intellect when talking to me about books and about the world. Okay, the last question. Um, do you trust your generous husband, Bluebeard, or do you hold unkind suspicions? Why is that? Patel. I am suspicious. I think this aspect uh, never trusts, has a natural distrust of suitors in general, let alone the husband-to-be, so, and especially because it's very too, like, really too good to be true, so I think there's something amiss. Uh, Same question for the mother. I'm gonna say that the mother trusts him, that she has the, the why would, why would he be so generous uh, if he had uh, untoward intentions? Uh, Virgin. Okay, so the Virgin does trust her husband because she must otherwise it's almost like this kind of denial of like he's the one who proposed marriage my other the other one didn't so therefore this person must be trustworthy there's i feel there's a little more desperation in it than um logic i feel all right and which so i think for me I'm kind of on the fence in a way because suddenly a this gentleman has appeared in my life and is is not seeing me as um as weird for wanting to read books and like be with nature and and enjoy discussions and stuff. So I think to to err on one side, I guess I think I am sort of taken aback by this sudden this sort of thing, and I'm kind of into it like. This is the first time this has ever sort of happened that someone's shown interest in something I really enjoy and has given me like a book of poetry about it. And so, yeah, I think I just, I'm like, wow. Uh, yeah. So I think I, I, I err slightly on trusting him. So you do trust, but err on the side of caution. Yeah, I think, I think, because I've just never had that experience before, I would say. All right. So I think that's all the questions. All right, next stop is sisterly bonds. As part of character creation, you'll establish a relationship with your other sisters um, and stay with you. On each character sheet under sisterly bonds, there's a statement about how a sister feels with the other characters and sisters in general, followed by two fill in the blank statements. We'll do this in rounds, one question at a time, just to make sure everybody is being connected to pr- and no one's being left out. All right, uh, Fatal, your first question is, your sisters are who they are. Boring and predictable, but blank has no idea of a woman's true power. Explain why you wish to teach her. I choose the witch, and I think it's more of a, well, she has basically 
theoretical aspect of things with reading books and all that knowledge. So I feel like I will teach her the more um, how to apply it. Um, we're going to go to the mother next. You know best and try to guide your wayward sisters, but blank irritates you with their obstinance. <laughs> Explain a time they undermined your authority. Uh, I'm going to say fatal, probably. <laughs> probably uh, irritates. I didn't want to say I, I figured, but like, yeah. <laughs> I think we all got there eventually. I, 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 I think uh, it's, it might be a little stereotypical, but I think that makes the most sense. Oh yeah, no, there are some <laughs> there are some blanks where I'm like, this is you this should, shouldn't this shouldn't be blank. Yeah, this should not be blank. <laughs> I'm I'm thinking that there it's probably there was a t- an important dinner again I'm very food based mom, <laughs> <laughs> and we're trying to use our best table manners. And Fatal is just trying to be really seductive. Oh, yeah. I was using strawberries and not using them in the way that they should be. Totally. And just really using the uh, dinner time to be seductive when this should be a time for decorum. And I love it that it's in your domain, like the kitchen. Like, like <laughs> what are you doing? Your realm, and I am just like mucking it up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the next is um, the Virgin. You trust your sisters for the most part, but X blackens your innocence with her every word. Explain how she became your enemy. I feel like it has to be the Fatal just for this particular <laughs> question because I also with the, the with, with the trust, with the whole like whether we trust or not, the only one who was, and also is directly related to my exact sort of like denial. So yeah, I think the fatal blackens my innocence with her every word with logic, man. Go ahead with the witch. Your sisters are not nearly as important as power, but blank is a useful tool. Explain how they helped you or helped your pursuit of blasphemous craft. So I'm going to say the virgin for this because I feel because I the way I sort of do my research and do the reading and stuff I think people see like oh that's not proper that's not ladylike etc. But because of sort of the virgin sort of innocence I'm like oh it's it's nothing I'm just I'm just curious oh you know that sort of like horrible coyness about everything people are like oh she's totally innocent it's totally fine so that's why I'm going to say the virgin for this one. And uh, start again at the top with the Patel. Let's do your second question. Okay, your sisters are who they are, boring and predictable, but you try to draw in the Virgin with your seductive aura. Explain how you hide your insecurities from her. Yeah, I think it's just because the Virgin and Fatal seem like such opposites that there is something like the Virgin's vulnerability and that trust um, that... Fatal lacks, but also kind of envies sometimes. So uh, she definitely wants to hide that insecureness and just tries to, and that's why she kind of uses her seduction as a shield, I guess. So the Virgin doesn't know that because she'd rather die than admit that she admires that aspect of the Virgin. Okay, very cool. Um, Mother. Uh, you trust blank to have your back. Explain a time they supported you in a time of need. Um, I'm going to say I trust the witch uh, to have your back. Uh, I think because the mother is powerful, and I think the witch uh, has my back because the witch wants my power and my approval. Mm. I got you that sweet, sweet recipe. <laughs> <laughs> You unburned my dinner and saved it from disaster. I added extra salt. There you go. Wow. You Done. made my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the virgin. You trust your sisters for the most part, but the mother often helps you play tricks on the others. Explain a time she was your ally in mischief. I'm going to say with all that food knowledge and food, like, you know, domain, I think we've done some fake food, you know, where something's supposed to be something, but it turns out to be other, like, for example, cake, which is just mashed potatoes and meatloaf, or, you know, vice versa, sort of a thing. And the witch. 
Your sisters are not nearly as important as power, but blank draws an evil to her. Explain what you have done to keep that evil at bay. I'm going to say the mother for this one. Basically, she's very good at making lots of food and it's mm, delicious. But as a result, she gets a lot of unwanted attention. Like lots of people sort of come around, maybe take advantage of the way she's always preparing, always like is the best. So I think what I would try and do to keep that sort of evil about people taking up her time and her, her sort of um, capacity, not really capacity, but like um, just giving all that effort, but maybe not getting thanked for it or not getting gratitude for it. Cause you would help people out in a tight spot for all those, you know, last minute banquets you've been helping with. Um, I think what I would have done, I would have sort of um, encouraged people to like, look, I'll show you how to cook together and like teach people how to do certain quick meals. Um, sorry, the one that comes to my mind is my own speciality is uh, is um, a cheesy rice, which probably isn't a fantasy setting sort of thing, but like um, a quick sort of meal, something that with some grains and then like a meat or two, but it's like, look, this is simple, it'll keep everyone happy and here's a list of it and, and, and send them on their way whilst keeping the good stuff for ourselves. All right, now that we have our questions, uh, we fill out our stats. There are three stats within this game. Uh, blood, carnality, and resilience. Blood is your connection to the horrific. How closely tied are you to the darkest sides of human nature? Carnality is your expression of the horrific. Do you weaponize your sexuality or give it into the base instincts such as violence? And resilience. Resilience in, is your resistance to the horrific. How much horror can you stand before you break? Uh, you are given already a plus one for each of your uh, staffs. Um, please fill out the other two with a zero or a negative one. So basically, like I said, there's three ways this game can end. One is the track of loyalty, meaning that you'll stay with Bluebeard. Another is a track of disloyalty, where you'll either run away forever or go to the authorities. Or the third one, which I hope we don't go to, but it might happen, um, all of you shatter. That's another option that we can look at. Um, Y'all could all just break and become just another ghost in the cog. And once we are ready, we can go ahead and get started with the first room. Bluebeard's bride is Fiona as the witch, Miriam as the virgin, Gemma as the fatale, Diana as the mother, and Morgan as the groundskeeper. 